And Miss Cindy knows all the oldest. That tells you about her age. <laughs> How many of you know what she just finished playing? I guarantee you some of you young people, if you know what she was just playing, raise your hand. I don't know what that's a reflection on your knowledge or her P-Nana playing. I don't know which that is. I know it, it's not a reflection on her P-Nana playing. It's a reflection on that's what's wrong. Anybody, again, maybe I, maybe I missed it. How many of you knew what Cindy was just playing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Old people, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I told you this, old people. The oldest knew that. It took a miracle of love and grace. Took a miracle. I told somebody just this week, I was talking to somebody just this week, and I can't remember who it was. It doesn't matter who it was. But I was making the comment, Cindy, that one of the things this generation is missing is the knowledge of these great, great old hymns and gospel songs. Because there's a message in that. It took a miracle of love and grace. All they know is 7-Eleven. They sing seven words 11 times. That's about their knowledge. <laughs> I'm serious, man. These old hymns just get down in the doldrums. And uh, you'll find out when God puts those old songs on your lips and you start singing them, you'll find out they'll lift you. They'll lift you out of the they'll lift you out of the doldrums, I guarantee you. And uh, I have an apology to make. You won't hear me say this again ever. Because I don't have many apologies to make. Uh, but I do this week. Uh, I do have an apology. Ten years ago, if one of you had come up to me this morning and said, Pastor, my dog or my cat died. And I'd say, well, I'm sorry. I'd have walked on. We had to put our buddy to sleep Monday. <laughs> it's been a crying time <laughs> around the long household. Uh, so I can understand now how attached I never dreamed a little dog could get that big a place in our hearts. And uh, so we had to put him to sleep. He got too bad. And, uh, if any of you ever have that experience again, call on me. I'm now an expert in conducting dog funerals. <laughs> now, literally, we did give our dog a a decent burial. I had a casket built and we went out in the country and buried him on my son's property and uh, did it the right way. They do. God gave them. God didn't just put them here for just to be here. I found out God put them here for a purpose. And I thank God for it. And so uh, if I ever offended you in any way when you had something like that happen to you, I truly apologize. It's good to be here, Father. Uh, nothing I've understood better this week, and I perhaps have understood some things in the past. There's nothing that happens to us. There's nothing that uh, we encounter that took you by surprise. And I'm thankful that you you bring people bring animals into our lives to enrich us. And Mom and I have been enriched for these number of years by people of Union Baptist Church, and for that we thank you. Thank you for your grace, particularly this week. I know there are those this morning who are going through rather difficult times, some really difficult times, some here this morning. And Lord, I just pray this morning the Holy Spirit of God about whom we're going to speak this morning will Move upon our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen.
song we're going to sing. So let's stand together and we'll sing through this two times. Engage for our time of prayer, and let me give you a couple requests that are not on the uh, uh, bulletin this morning. Uh, Michael Dale, our director of missions and the son-in-law of of Miss Nancy Dick, and uh, brother-in-law to to, uh, Ellen and, and and Randy. Uh, has been diagnosed with cancer and is going to have to undergo cancer treatment soon. Keep him in your prayers. Michael McMahon's mother is facing surgery this coming week, at, uh, this week at, uh, at PMC. Remember her in prayer. Also, Ladder was struck by a drunk driver last evening and uh, he's not in the hospital. None of those injuries, but he's pretty, pretty bummed up. And... Uh, Please keep him in your prayers. Uh, it's so, so good to have Miss go forth and her daughter Kathy this morning not been here, able to be here for some time. And then Garland uh, Clark is very ill this morning. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here and to pray. You said, come unto me all you that labor and all that heavy laden and I'll give you rest. There's some that have heavy hearts this morning. They're heavy laden. Some it's due to physical ailments. Some it's due to the emotional strain of all they've been going through lately. Some father, family members facing surgery. And I pray for Michael's mother. I pray for Officer Louder this morning. I, I pray for Mike as he anticipates surgery. I just pray, Father, your spirit would be very real to them this morning. Draw them. Uh, we sing that old song sometimes. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. And my prayer for all of us this morning is that in the process of this service, be it through the singing, be it through the reading of the word of God, be it through the preaching or whatever, that we'll find ourselves being drawn, a uh, yea, a little bit closer to Jesus. We thank you for our country, Father. This is a great, great country. And Father, we who are older have seen the departure uh, in ways, Father, that a few years ago we, would, we could never have imagined. And Lord, the only answer is to turn back to God. And you gave us that answer in Second Chronicles 7, 14 when you said to my people, called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. God, if there's somebody here this morning who's not a Christian, I pray the Holy Spirit would draw them to a saving relationship with Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. things without them, it can be a challenge sometimes. So I'm looking at the back of the bulletin, and 
and uh, I see Ray's got an announcement for the the uh, benefit for uh, Tony Childers coming up. He's got the information on there, so you know, keep that in mind next week over in Hickory Grove next Saturday, May the fifth. But when I was looking at it, I thought it said Team Tony Bennett, and I thought, well, it's good that you know. Glad that Tony Bennett is older than he is, is still out there singing, and he's got a team of supporters. But you know, so you know, so you got to wear those glasses so you know what's what you're reading there. Uh, we're going to sing some more. Speaking of Tony Bennett, we're not going to do any pop or jazz, but we're going to sing some hymns. And our next one is Holy Ground, and that's 138. If you're following along in your hymn book. And then after that, we'll have another hymn before our offering time. So let's stand up and sing Holy Ground. We'll sing through it and then repeat the song. standing with me as we get ready for our morning offering time. We're going to sing freely, freely. So uh, it's only two verses to the song, so after the end of this song, we'll have our morning offering. Let's sing together.
I listen to a lot of Gaither music during the week. I don't, I don't, I don't know how y'all worship at home, you know, but uh, I listen to a lot of music, and uh, one song always stands out to me every week. And uh, this week it was uh, I Am Redeemed by uh, the Dixon. I, I, I can't remember what his, what his first name is. But he, uh, he's not with us anymore. But that song, it, it, you know, uh, we're redeemed with a price. just thought about that, you know, all week long, and uh, it, it, it's very special to me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we it's just a blessing just to be in your house. Father, as we come, we see people that, that maybe it's hard for them to get here. They are an encouragement to others. Father, we, we love you. We, we love our church. We are thankful for the spiritual gifts that you give to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Father, as we come this morning to this time where we offer our gifts and our tithes back to you. Lord, we lift up our church family. We need one another. Just help, just ask you this morning just to help us. Invite the Holy Spirit to be here this morning with each one of us. And Father, I just pray that we would each open our hearts to receive the truth that you have for us today. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
what if you had to sit here for a solid hour just seeing? You'd say, I ain't got my nerve pills with me, preacher. I can't sit that long. <laughs> I, I have long said it would be wonderful sometime to come to church and just sit and meditate in the presence of God. It really, really would be good just to say thank you for that song during the offertory. Uh, Cindy, she had no idea what I was preaching on this morning. Truth is, I don't either. So, uh. <laughs> Yes, sir. Go ahead. You mean we don't have any troops up on the Marines? Okay, the Marines have been pulled out. Yeah. That's great. <clears throat> I'll give you a, a verse of scripture. Y'all ponder it. And in a short while, you'll look at the old man and say, oh. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You think about that. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look it up. Howard, thank you. He's a good old man. He spoke volumes this morning, and I don't know whether you picked up on it or not. What you do during the week affects how you worship God on Sunday. Did you hear that? If you listen to this trash all week long, don't expect to come to church on Sunday and have God speak to you. He's giving you a great recipe. Get you some good old-fashioned gospel music and hymns and just play them while you're around the house rather than listen to all of this trash that most people are listening to all the time. Thank you, Howard. He spoke volumes this morning, volumes, all of us. You know, be careful. Be careful what you let go in these two ears. But I can tell you something, it stays there. All right, I'm going to share this morning. <clears throat> and somebody remind me when we get through, I need to talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> Tony's event next Saturday and <clears throat> why it's important. So don't let me get out of here without doing that. Uh, <clears throat> I sore throat this morning. Um, Take your Bibles and turn to chapter 2 of the book of Acts. <clears throat> and this is, this ought to be a very familiar portion of God's Word. It ought to be. It is an extremely important chapter in the Bible. And the better we as Christians understand the work of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the better we will be able to relate to the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit and be able to experience His power. The Holy Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost is still the Holy Spirit at work today. Holy Spirit's not an it. Holy Spirit's a person. A member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each have a part to play in everything. We'll talk a little bit about that this morning. I'm not sure how far we'll 
be able to get. <clears throat> but when the day of Pentecost was fully come, you remember that Jesus had said to his, uh, his followers, the, the apostles, and, and that uh, inner circle of people, actually on the day of Pentecost it says there were 120, you remember that? Jesus had said to them prior to his leaving here, he said, go to, the, go to that room and stay there until uh, you receive the promise of the Father. And that's what happened on Pentecost. Um, he, he didn't give them some kind of uh, time schedule. He just said, go and wait. And... Uh, once again, and we looked at this some on Wednesday night, not this particular, but we looked at Elijah. And you can look at any great event in the Bible and any of the great men and women of the Bible, and you'll find the one thing that enabled them to stand out above all the others was obedience. The one thing above everything else God expects from Ray Long is to be obedient to him and today to his word. And so they obeyed. And verse 1 of chapter, chapter 2 says, When Pentecost came, they were all with one accord in one place. I'm not sure it would have happened without that unity. And I'm very convinced today that one of the reasons... Uh, Holy Spirit is not working in great power today is because there is not a oneness within the body of Christ. Not a oneness in most churches. That unity is essential. It's essential in the home. You, you, you show me a home that's all broken up and divided up uh, and I will show you a tragedy. You show me a church that's all broken up and divided up and I'll show you a tragedy. And so that, that unity, that one accordness is so essential to the work of God, essential to the work of the church, essential to my own personal relationship with, each, with you and with God. And suddenly, out of nowhere, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, I'm probably going to jump around a little bit. Bobby and I were talking a little bit about this earlier today. Uh, you cannot see the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see what? The evidence, the effect of the wind. And so I'm going to jump away a little bit further ahead, Bobby, from my notes and relate to you a conversation that Bobby and I had just before service today. As most of you know, on Thursday evenings, Bobby goes to the to the York County Jail, prison, whatever you, term you use to define it. And uh, Bobby teaches. Some of you may not know that they allowed that to happen. They do. And uh, <clears throat> Bobby was telling me the other day that the material that he uses is, is a material for the next Sunday's Sunday school lesson. Is, is that right? Yes. Bobby takes... Bobby took this week's Sunday school lesson for the adults. And Bobby used that to teach his lesson at the, at the prison or the county jail. And as best I remember that conversation, Bobby, you said to me, and he didn't know what I was preaching on this morning either. He said, I saw the Holy Spirit of God at work this past Thursday night. Well, that always interests me. If somebody tells me they see, he didn't see the Holy Spirit. He didn't see the wind. He didn't see the cloven tongues of fire. None of those things that's talked about in the book of Acts. But what Bobby saw, he interpreted it as evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you this from my experience of pastoring and in the church and my experience outside of the church. Whenever the Holy Spirit of God works, and I must be honest with you and tell you this morning, 
in today's society, that's not often. You look at me sort of strange if you want to. But I'm telling you, there's little evidence the Holy Spirit's working today. Little evidence. Bobby said, I saw one of the prisoners come under the effect of the gospel. And the Holy Spirit takes the gospel and the Holy Spirit affects the lives of people who hear it. Not all the people who hear it are affected by it. In a congregation this size this morning, you could go to a congregation of 5,000 people this morning. And the Holy Spirit may affect a handful of the people. And it may not affect the rest of the people. There are a lot of reasons for that. We don't have time to get into that. Some, people's, some people have allowed sin to so harden their hearts, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a place to work. Some people's lives are so full of themselves, the Holy Spirit has no place to work. But, but this young man came under the effect of the Holy Spirit. The way Bobby described it to me, I don't have any question that uh, what he described was true. That young man was so affected by the Holy Spirit that he wept for hours. Now let me say this. It's not always true that when people weep, they're being affected by the Holy Spirit. So I don't want anybody to think, well, a person doesn't weep, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit affects different people in different ways. I've had the Holy Spirit affect me and I would just weep. I've had the Holy Spirit affect my life. At times I'd sit in silence waiting on God to speak. But he saw the effect of the Holy Spirit in the life of that prisoner. I don't care whether it's in a prison. I don't care whether it's in a mental institution. I don't care whether it's in a hospital. I don't care whether it's in a home. The Holy Spirit of God can work wherever and whenever it chooses to work. Bible says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou, hear, thou, thou, see, thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it cometh. The Holy Spirit chooses where it wants to work, when it wants to work. And don't forget that. The Holy Spirit of God chooses to work how it wants to work, when it wants to work, and where it wants to work. But the Holy Spirit has got to, Holy Spirit has to have a receiving heart. And so there was a receiving heart. Could have been some old grandmother somewhere been praying for him for years. Could have been a godly mother somewhere that's been praying, burdened over a son that's in prison for a long period of time. And, and, and those prayers are now being answered as the Holy Spirit speaks to that young man. So I'm jumping around a little bit. Holy Spirit came. If we're, going to better, if we're going to fully understand what God expects and desires and wants of the church today, we'd better understand what happened on that day of Pentecost when the church was formed. It's essential. What God did then, God wants to do today and every day. Listen to me carefully. What God did then, God chooses to do any time and every time God's people are willing to let it happen. God could have sent the Holy Spirit the first day they went up to that upper room. It wasn't a necessity of God having to prepare himself to send the Holy Spirit. It was, a, it was a problem of the people preparing themselves to receive the Holy Spirit. And the problem in the church today is not that God is, that God is being delayed, except by the fact God's waiting on us to get our hearts prepared to receive. Okay, a couple of things. The Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Now the Holy Spirit has been active much prior to Pentecost. The Holy Spirit of God was active the day God created this world. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because God said in the book of Genesis... Let us. You see, on the day of creation, the day that God formed all this stuff, the day, the day that God formed man, present on that day was God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. All three were, all three were active on the day of creation. 
and all throughout the book of the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was working. There's something distinctly different about Pentecost, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people when they needed the Holy Spirit to perform some particular work. But the Holy Spirit never dwelt in the people during the days of the Old Testament. And I'm fast forwarding a little bit, quickly. The, the Holy Spirit was active in the life of Jesus on this earth. You say, you see, you ask, well, Pastor, what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God came and dwelt permanently in the heart of all believers. Now, let me say something I'm probably going to need to say more than once. The day that you were saved, whenever that day was, immediately the day that your name was, was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you were washed in the blood of Jesus. On that day, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you permanently. Are you all listening? This is, this is Church 101. It's essential. If you don't understand this, friend, you need to go home and check up whether or not you're saved. Because if you don't understand that when you got saved, you don't understand that. You don't understand that the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside of you and dwell your heart. Friend, not sure you're saved. You got to know that. It's a fact you cannot dispute. The day as a nine-year-old boy sitting on the side of that die branch that I go by quite often time, I want to be reminded of that day that I met Jesus. And I passed that place sitting there as a nine-year-old boy and Roger Snipes using the wordless book. I ran into one the other day when I was doing some cleaning up at the house. Uh, and uh, it always reminds me, student at New Orleans Seminary, our church had asked him to come and work with the youth during the summer, took us down to a little ball field, nothing like these elaborate things they have today, just an open field. He set us down after we'd played ball. He shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit impacted my life. I asked Jesus to come into my heart that day and the Holy Spirit of God came into my heart to indwell me until eternity and eternity and eternity. Now here's the thing. <laughs> Michael, you did an excellent job last Sunday. His heart and my heart are right on the same line when it comes to people making sure they're saved. Not everyone, I think you quoted this, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Did you quote that? Pretty good for an old man. <laughs> He's got the same heart as I've got. You know what it is? Everybody make sure you're saved. Periodically. Periodically, you ought to go somewhere alone, just you and no television, no radio, nobody, but you and the Lord. And you need to get alone with God. And you need, to, you need to determine in your heart of hearts whether or not you're truly saved. Not everybody saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everybody that says a sinner's prayer. I'll say this to you again. A little old book, I wish everybody would read it. It's a little yellow book. Stop asking Jesus in your heart. There are going to be more people in hell who said the sinner's prayer than perhaps any other group of people. I love you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. We've got to thank God a in some ways, this new generation of preachers, I'm not sure about. But I'm finding more and more and more of them. 
that are deeply concerned about this subject of salvation of the Holy Spirit. Very excited about that part. Because you see, unless the Spirit draws, you cannot come. You can hear the gospel a thousand times. You can sing the hymns 10,000 times. You can say the sinner's prayer over and over. But unless the Holy Spirit, that's what happened on Pentecost. I'm fast forward. What, why did those 3,000 people come to faith in Christ? Because the Holy Spirit exercises his work. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit's come, he will, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict. Unless the Spirit draws you into that process, you can't be saved. As a pastor, I, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I've got some accounting to do to God one day. I've had 50 to 100 kids more than one time in a Bible school come down front. Now listen to me. I ain't the only one who's guilty. Come down to the front during a Thursday evening. We, call it evang we called it an evangelistic service. Some, some of you remember that? I reckon the rest of you just heathens, you didn't go to Bible school. <laughs> but you remember that? Pastor, give you that little Romans road. Romans road. To, you remember that? Romans road. Nothing wrong with it. Not discounting it. It's giving it the right context and with the right explanation. But so oftentimes we didn't give the full explanation in the right context of it. And here's what we said. Just say this prayer after me. And you're going to be saved. The prayer doesn't save you. It's not what's on your lips. It's what's in your heart. Amen. Unless a heart has been moved upon by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, ask, i tell you a good way to ask somebody, this is particularly true with children, have you ever sinned? Well, if a child tells me I've never sinned, then they're not to that point. You can't be saved. You see, let me get this right now. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And there's a difference in the two. You see that little baby born in the, born in the delivery room at Piedmont Hospital this morning. That baby is born a sinner. The total depravity of man. I should have preached Church 101 a long time ago, maybe. Do you understand that? If you don't understand that you're a sinner, you don't need a Savior. If you don't understand you're a sinner, you don't need a Savior. All has sinned and come short of the glory of God. No exceptions to it whatsoever. Best person in the world is a sinner. And some people object to that idea of the total depravity of man, but it's true. And what happened on the day of Pentecost is the Spirit of God came down. And under the, under the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'll probably talk about this again sometime, the power of the Holy Spirit came down. Let me just say this little thing. The tongues was not in unintelligible language it was a language that every man from all, all those different nations understood. Whatever he was, he understood the gospel being preached by Peter. It wasn't some language they didn't understand. It was a language they did understand. And that's why there were 3,000 people converted on that day. Holy Spirit, essential to every, and we've gotten away from this. Holy Spirit is essential to everything that we do from the time we meet Jesus until the time that we go home to heaven. It's essential. Well, I'm watching my clock. Okay, two things happened. They were baptized that day in the Holy, by the Holy Spirit. Now, water baptism is simply a public witness to the fact that you have found Jesus and you have decided that you want to follow Jesus. That's what it is. 
You fill this pool up. I could take every one of you and dunk you in that pool. Get out of that pool, find a creek back here somewhere and dunk you, dunk you in that pool. Travel out to Lake Wiley and dunk you in Lake Wiley. And if you're lost, you'll still be lost. Sometimes I have had the experience to hold people under the water and they'd come up and ask, Pastor, why would you keep me so long? I said, I want your pocketbook to be baptized too. <laughs> want all of you to be baptized. Sometimes you, you, uh, somebody like me will get a hold of some big guy and uh, I can't quite, can't quite get him all under at one time. I'll keep on until I do. <laughs> it really wouldn't matter whether I got that top hair hanging, sticking up or nothing. It wouldn't matter. It is a public witness to your personal faith in Jesus Christ and your witness to those who are watching that from this point on, I'm going to follow Jesus. That's what it means. What the baptism you don't have to ask for the baptism. You don't have to pray for the baptism. It is an automatic thing that happens when you're saved, born again, washed in the blood, name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But there's something else that happened on Pentecost. Not only were they baptized that day with the Holy Spirit, I'll tell you something else that happened. Boy, this, this, please listen to this. I want you to read I want you to read this week. Ephesians chapter 5. Wouldn't hurt you to read the entire book of Ephesians. A great book. Boy, it teaches us much about the life that we're to live in Christ as believers. But chapter 5 of Ephesians says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, or as imitators. You see, we're supposed to imitate the Lord Jesus. Did you know that? That's why the people were first called Christians at Antioch because they imitated the life of Jesus. They were, they were little Jesuses. Walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, he gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Fornication. All uncleanliness. Or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And Paul goes on to list a number of things. I'm going to drop down a few verses. He says in verse 8, you were sometimes living in darkness. That's where all of us, before we came to Jesus, we were living in darkness, surrounded by it. But now are ye light in the Lord, no longer walk in darkness, walk in light as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Have no fellowship. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, expose them, reject them. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Amen. So see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools. But as wise people, be careful how you walk every day. Walk as a wise man. Be cautious how you walk, where you walk. It's important. Now he said, redeeming the times because the days are evil. It simply means make the best of the time that God has put you here on this earth. And if Paul said to the Ephesian Christians, the church, times are evil, man, what would you say about us? We do live in evil days, very, very evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's important. Know what God's will for your life is. 
That's something I, that's something I seek every single day of my life to know what God's will is for that day in the future. Now, this is what I want you to see. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, I want you to listen to me. Those men and women in that upper room that day were filled full of the Holy Spirit. Fill up. Just filled up. Overflow. Now, when those sinners were converted on that day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit baptized them into the body of Christ. And I wish I had a lot of time to talk about that. If you're saved, you've been baptized into the body of Christ. Doesn't this mean Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Episcopalians, whatever. We've all been baptized into the body of Christ. It's not just the Baptists who are going to heaven. I do have to admit that we're going to be first in line. The rest of you line up behind us. Oh, we, we Baptists are going to be probably pretty shocked. You know, it, it, it's, it's, the, the true church is made up of people of every denomination. Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Catholics, denomination doesn't matter. We're baptized into the full body of Jesus Christ. And so that Catholic brother or sister who's been saved is much my brother or sister in Christ as any one of you Baptists are. Some people have a little problem with that. I don't. But not only were they baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And folks, I want to tell you something. Most valuable membership that you, can, that you can brag about is your membership in the body of Jesus Christ. People talk about, well, how important my membership is in this club, that club, the other club. I, I sat with a man the other evening. Took a long time to tell that story. I don't know how many millions he was worth, but he was worth a whole heap of them. Guarantee you. He, uh, I tell you this, had him been on a, a spring, spring game. Tell you how much he's given to Ipte. They let him dress out as one of the coaches and be on the sideline with the coaches. He gave more than a dollar or two that you and I give. I guarantee you. I mean, that, this guy just rolling, rolling, rolling in the money. But he's a saved man. His theology differed a little from mine, and that's okay. He's a saved man. He's my brother in Christ. He is my brother in Christ. Because the same spirit that baptized him into the body is the same spirit that baptized me into the body. Now let me close with this part, and it's almost 12. I won't get you out of... Well, you, you, you don't have a cafeteria to go to anyway because Jackson's closed up. I don't know where you go eat on Sunday. <laughs> I never was able to get in front of the line. You know. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a difference between the baptism and the filling. When you were saved, I know I'm taking time. This is important because I just gain, I gather by the looks on some of your faces, this is Church 101. When you were saved, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You were also filled that day with the Holy Spirit of God. Filled full up. Do we stay filled? Do we say? Do we stay filled up? No. We, we talk about that all morning couple of things when these unsaved people saw and heard these men and women of God reacting in the way they reacted to the Holy Spirit what did they say about them and what it couldn't happen because Peter said it's only it's not nine o'clock yet they lived a little different, Howard, than we live today. <laughs> I see quite a few, uh, quite a few drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. But uh, 
they, uh, they said, these people are drunk. They're acting like intoxicated people. Now, what did Paul say in the passage I just wrote in Ephesians chapter 5? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would Paul <coughs> use the analogy of being drunk with wine and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Anybody else got an answer? I'm sorry, I've got a sore throat this morning. Howard says they were happy. Well, that's very evident. In fact, it says over in Ephesians, when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, they sing songs. They're happy. They rejoice. They praise God. That is an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. But why did Paul use that particular uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being drunk with wine? Let me, let me hurry. Somebody told me some years ago, and I cannot remember all of them. I'll give you the ones I can remember. There are five different kinds of alcohol. Did y'all know that? Not bourbon and vodka and whatever all the others are. I don't know what they are. I'm not talking about the five different, six, seven, eight, ten different kinds. Somebody told me many years ago there are five different kinds of alcohol. Now follow me real carefully and we get out of here. There's a kind of alcohol that takes a normally mild-mannered man and makes him into a violent man. You ever seen that? My father was, you'd meet my father, normally meet my dad. He was just a jovial guy, just a friendly guy, you know, but boy, give him a few drinks and he terrorized his family. What did it? The alcohol did. There are some, you know, that make them really happy, uh, uh, Harry. Uh, I have seen those people that, Really said very little. Boy, you give them a few drinks, and boy, it's, it's on. They can't do anything but laugh. Now, now y'all help me. Have y'all seen these kind of people? I, I've, seen those, I've seen those kind that just really make them melancholy. You ever seen that one? I've seen those. I've seen them sometimes. Now, that, they weren't a threat to anybody. You give them a few drinks and give him his old-fashioned cheer. Drooling at the mouth. But he ain't bothered nobody. He ain't bothered a soul. And then there's that kind that makes people generous. I mean really generous. They give away the kitchen sink. I had an uncle like that. I, I can still see my Uncle Sam. He's a little short fellow. Ran a little grocery, community grocery store when I was growing up. Lived with my Grammy right down the street. Great guy. He helped get me through college financially. But somebody had come down to the granny's about two houses down, knock on the door and say, Miss Long, you about to go up and get Sam. Said he's about to give that store away. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they wanted, he just give them whatever they wanted. I mean, he was that kind of person. He really was. Now he didn't do that when he's sober. But somebody'd bring a bottle along, he'd take a couple of drinks and there. You see, what am I saying to you? The alcohol eventually controls in some way that person. Are you listening? You see, the analogy, Paul, listen to me. This is the most important thing I'll say. When the Holy Spirit of God really controls you, you're emptied of self. Self's not a part of it. It's just the Holy Spirit comes in to fill you. Friend, you don't control yourself anymore. Holy Spirit controls you. Holy Spirit tells you what to say, what to do, where to go. I could, I could stand here all afternoon and tell you story after story just from my life when at times the Holy Spirit controlled me. Does the Holy Spirit control me every day? Ask Mary. She'll tell you no. <laughs> don't, don't look at me, fellas, and laugh. 
I'll be calling up your wife and asking her about you. You see, the truth is, the truth is, when the Holy Spirit fills us completely, oh, we can't sing enough. People tell me, well, I can't sing. Get full of the Holy Spirit and you'll sing something. <laughs> you, you'll be full of joy. That's why I sit down here sometimes and raise my hand. Don't think that we're going to church you if you raise your hand once in a while or say amen or hallelujah, praise God. We ain't going to church you. I'm going to be thrilled that you've got enough in you to do it. Let me tell you a story, and I've told this before, but it's the best illustration I know of. Many years ago, it's a true story. It wasn't my story. Somebody else's story I heard them tell. Back in the days when churches had regular revival meetings, I remember those days. Some of you do. Mr. Bill remembers when they had revival here every third, every third, Sunday in, every third week in August. That's because the crops got laid by. Hands didn't have much to do in the field, so they had a revival meeting. Ain't that pretty much right? That's the way it happened. So this town drunk, he would, every year they had the big, I mean, back in those days, everybody, if you want to know what this is like, drive by any black American church the third week of August. I think that's it. And I guarantee you that church property will be overflowing with cars. About like the black funeral I went to on Monday. A thousand people there. Lasted two and a half hours. <laughs> I told my friends who were going with me, I said, now, get ready, take your lunch with you, because you're going to be here about two and a half hours. And it was. Well, that's the way the revival meetings are. Everybody comes from everywhere, and so they did. This old boy, every time they'd have an altar call, He'd lick his spit to the altar and get on his knees and he'd just cry to God and he would just cry and plead with God and finally one of the old deacons. I heard his name was Mr. Bill Wood. I don't know. <laughs> said, Mr. Bill got up and said, Lord, don't do it because he leaks too much. <laughs> In other words, what they meant is next week he's going to be drunk again. That's true with some people. So an emotional experience does not necessarily mean a Holy Spirit experience. But I promise you this, when the Holy Spirit comes in. Got to say this. What did it say? They were awed and they marveled. Bobby, were you awed and marveled Thursday evening? Show me the work of the Holy Spirit, whether it's in church, home, or the prison, and people would be awed by. We ought to listen to me in our close. The truth is, every church, every Sunday, we leave the service. We ought to be awed and marveled that God did something that human beings could not do or fully describe. You know where God wants to begin? God wants to save you. Are you saved? We had, a, we had our experience Monday with our little buddy. Still ain't over it. Left prayer meeting here Wednesday night. It's not a, not a secret because it was in the newspaper, so I can tell it. Driving down the road, phone rang. My son David. David said, Daddy, have Mama, because he knew I couldn't do it. He said, have Mama pull up a hair alone line. I said, what's there, David? He said, just have Mama pull up hair alone line. She did. The story's there. It's on Thursday's, in Thursday's paper. Four teenagers rescued from the raging waters of the Catawba River. One of those teenagers was my 18-year-old grandson. He clung on a limb for his life and said, Daddy, I've never been as frightened I thought I was going to die. He told me, shake it. <laughs> That's shaking. So I thought he was going to die. So I thought was, they clung on a limb. It's in all kind of rescue vehicles out there, according to the newspaper. I, I told his dad later, I'm glad we didn't know what's going on because I'd have had a heart attack and died. 
He said, Papa told his dad, he said, Daddy, I didn't know what I was going to live or not. And you know what the truth is? God forbid, but we could be here with a different story this morning. That's life. Officer Larry got struck last evening. I haven't had a chance to talk to him. Travis has talked to him. I'll talk to him sometime today. He didn't go on duty yesterday thinking some drunk driver's going to hit him. You see, the truth is, he could have got killed. The only thing I told Travis was, that man better thank God this old man ain't sitting there this morning setting bars because he wouldn't be getting out of jail anytime in the near future. Anybody that'll do that deserves strict punishment. But you see, we could be here grieving this morning Officer Louder's life. We could be here grieving my grandson's life today. Loss of a puppy dog hurt, but nothing would hurt as deeply as that to happen. You see, something could happen to you before next Sunday rolls around, and you could go out into eternity and meet God. Listen carefully. Are you ready to meet him? Come, Greg, let's sing our hymn of invitation. For the Father, I have sensed your presence today, and I'm thankful for that. These thoughts were given to me by you early in the week and you helped me prepare them and sometimes agonize over the different points. But I'm praying this morning, number one, there's somebody here that cannot say beyond any shadow of a doubt, Pastor, if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I pray the Holy Spirit of God as it worked on that man on Thursday evening in the prison. It'll work on some heart or hearts today, young or old. It walked down this aisle and said, Pastor, I want to know beyond any shadow of a doubt, I'm saved. Somebody needs to come and transfer membership into this church. Somebody needs to come at this altar. As a Christian, know they're born again. Know they're washed in the blood. Know their name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. But they, want to, they simply want it to be a better life for them. They want the feeling of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand as we sing. invitation. Let me ask you to be seated for just a moment.
I have several announcements. I've waited until now to, sh to, to share them because I want you to remember these different events. Coming up next Sunday, you know, we have our, our monthly breakfast, and Brother Ben's class will be providing us uh, with some goodies. They always do a great job. Um, there's a youth fishing. This is youth and children day, right? Anybody wants to come? Last year, he and Miss Sue uh, allowed their land out toward Sharon to be used, and it was a great event. Uh, I wasn't able to attend, but I plan to be there uh, on the 12th. It's 9 o'clock in the morning, so if, if your child needs a transportation or anything, uh, see Dave or Chase, and it will be a great, great day together with the children. Fishing and uh, so many other different activities there out in the country, they will be uh, chaperone properly. Uh, I promise you that. Okay. Let me see. Okay. I want to tell you about the fundraiser this coming Saturday over in Hickory Grove. Most of you know Tony Childers. If you don't, let me tell you briefly about Tony. Tony is a fine, one of the finest men I know. He has provided barbecue for us at Union more than one time. He's done it for churches all over the county. He, he does a big fundraiser for a release Bible study time. He provides a barbecue. Tony never charges us any more than the actual cost of the meat. Show me another businessman who'll do that. He's been very generous in a lot of ways. Tony spent five weeks in intensive care at Piedmont, had open heart surgery and things didn't go well. They're doing a fundraiser for him over in Hickory Grove this coming Saturday from uh, 10 in the morning to 6. There's going to be games. There's going to be food. There's going to be an opportunity for you to, to make a donation to, to, to his fund. Let me tell you this. We as a church, because we care so much about Tony and know what financial obligations he's got, our church out of our community missions fund is making a donation to Tony's fund. I want you to know that. This is the way our deacons handle those matters and I'm very thankful they're that kind of men. But you can also go and contribute. I plan to, uh, I plan to do that. Uh, now, Wednesday night, come Wednesday afternoon, about uh, 5 o'clock, we're going to get together, some of us, and we're going to pray that everybody's television who's here this morning will just burn up. Because I know that's the excuse some of you use to stay away on Wednesday nights. And I don't know why. These dear ladies and men, uh, uh, Wanda and Pat and Ernest and, and Sue and Miss Debbie, they prepare the best meal you'll ever find for $3. You couldn't go anywhere and get the meal any Wednesday night. It's a great meal, great fellowship. You need to come. But next Thursday is, uh, this coming Thursday is National Day of Prayer. Well, I know most of you can't attend those normal Thursday services like the City Hall in Rock Hill in York. Mary and I always make an effort to attend. So I think America is in such condition, we need prayer, folks. Now, y'all can sit here and think, America has one foot in hell and the other on a banana peeling. Now, if you think I'm wrong, hide and watch. And the only answer is prayer. Just begging God, every one of you, you should not have any excuse. Nobody here, nobody. If you don't have transportation, we'll provide transportation. And everybody ought to be here. At 7 o'clock, we're going to have a special service of prayer for America. And I hope across America there'll be churches like ours that will do. We need to pray, folks. My people, call by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. Please be here. Please don't let us gather and, well, so-and-so ain't here. Send up a little prayer to have them. Cut that TV off for them. <laughs> you need to be here, folks. It's serious business. I love this country. I don't have as long left here as some of you do. Think about your children, what they're going to live through. If America doesn't change. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Somebody look that up and tell me next Sunday what it means. God bless you. Michael, come here. Didn't know he was going to call on you. We're glad to have this young man helping us. He's going to be a blessing. He's already a blessing. He's been a blessing. 
Uh, we've got graduation coming up, and that'll be in the newsletter this week. And, uh, Michael, I want you to pronounce the benediction for us. Would you please do that, son? Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you brought us here this morning. God, I thank you that you woke us up another day, Lord. Even just being here another day to do your will is a blessing from you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you sweep through the church, sweep through the congregation, Lord. I pray that you impact hearts. I pray that you not let somebody leave here not knowing whether or not that they know you, Lord. I pray that you place a burden on people's hearts, Lord, that if they don't know you, that they feel the call that you have to them, Lord. Thank you so much for all the blessings you provide. You bless us so wonderfully, and I thank you for each one of them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's just pray.